it's a model building kind of day. Don't go away. Hello everyone and welcome to Fat Guy Productions. I'm Paul, coming to you as always from beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. As long promised, today we bust out the Mobius Jupiter 2 model kit, along with the Mobius lighting kit and an aftermarket photo etch and decal set. This is a long build, so let's not waste any more time. As I'm going to be melding three kits, the Jupiter 2, the lighting kit, and the photo etch kit together, it has never been more important to thoroughly review all the instructions. I actually made notes from the lighting and photo etch on the instructions for the model so I wouldn't blow past an important phase. As you can see this model is huge. I think in part that is why the kit is so impressive and frankly very fun to build. The build will begin on the bottom of the spaceship, more specifically with the landing legs and landing wells. As always, I cut the parts from the sprues with my beloved Tamiya sprue cutters. These do cost a bit more but you will know why once you use them. They are awesome. Every single piece gets a complete once over and a clean up with an X-Acto and some sanding sticks. I test fit every step until I'm sure I have a firm grasp on what needs to be done. Often these steps can seem rudimentary, but trust me, they very often can head off big problems. In this build, I'll be using Tamiya Extra Thin Cement, Tamiya Quick Setting Extra Thin Cement, some thick CA glue, and believe it or not, some good old testers tube glue. The regular Tamiya will be the workhorse, and I'll explain why I use other glues when I switch. Here's a fun tip. Cut the sprues up after they're empty to make it easier for them to fit into the trash. It makes a world of difference. So anyhow, back to the build. Here we are at the very first stage of the lighting kit as there are many modifications we need to make to the model kit itself. Each landing well needs two holes. One is to light the landing well, and the others are for the switches and electrical connection. The instructions are pretty explicit about this step, and about the location of the landing well lights, but there is a vital word of caution for you for the holes for the switches. There's a lump where these holes go. I guess it's supposed to be a light or something. Snip it off or file it away, and put the hole right where that lump used to be. If the hole in the landing well is too far forward, you'll have a hell of a time putting in the retaining nut for the switches. Also, be sure to get the right size bit for the right spaces. Guessing will not do. I actually pulled out the lights to be sure I got the right size bits for the right size lights and the same for the switches. Remember, there are a lot of different components here. One hole does not fit all. Once I know for sure what size hole to make and where to put it, then and only then can I start drilling. Besides the holes in the landing bays, there are several holes to drill in the deck. I drilled them all except for the three that go under the command console. 
The directions are a bit vague there, and I wanted to wait to drill them until I could use the council to ensure the holes would be in the right place. I used a sharpie to mark each drilling location and also to write some labels to help keep things straight. With the initial parts ready and cleaned up, and the majority of the holes drilled, I can actually start gluing the landing legs together. Overall I'd say the fit of this kit is above average, but there were a few small issues, nothing to get in a twist over. I fit every part together and hold them in place while I touch the cement to the seam, allowing capillary action to pull the cement through the seam. Once the parts are dry, it's time for more cleanup with sanding, filing, and filling as needed. This kit was well designed and there really wasn't a lot of filling needed here. Here is something super important and I didn't see it mentioned in any of the instructions. You have to black out the model to prevent light leaks. The entire illusion is ruined if you turn on the lights and all of the plastic starts glowing. I primed everything with black primer to kill light leaks. Killing light leaks would apply to any kit that you're going to build with lights in it. If you need a reflective surface for the lights, you can then go back after the dark primer and put down a glossy white or a glossy silver to help the reflectivity but you must paint everything black to prevent it from leaking light. I'm adding the fusion core here and then soon the clear insert. Be sure to frost the insert with a light layer of white paint. I just use some white Tamiya fine primer to hide the inner workings and to diffuse the light. The white layer will hide all of the things you're not supposed to see but we'll let enough light through so it can burn bright and look amazing. So work continues on the lower hull. This build will have many small sub-assemblies and it can feel like you aren't making any progress and then BAM! All of a sudden you're doing final assembly. This build comes into several steps which I would break down into lower hull, interior pieces, lighting, and then final assembly, with the interior pieces taking a very, 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 very long time, as there is so much detailing to do there. I'm going to go ahead and start building the interior walls. There's a lot of them to build, and now's a great time to get them assembled and set aside so that they can dry. After removing and cleaning up the wall parts, I clamp them together and then I apply the cement by touching it to the seams. As simple as that.
For some of the other wall sections, you can simply stand them up and brace them with whatever you have lying around, like paint bottles and such. While the glue dries on the sub-assemblies I have built already, I can go ahead and paint the hull of the ship. You have the upper and lower hulls, and three legs. This ended up being very problematic for me as the kit was so big. I tried airbrushing on aluminum buffing paint from testers, but it looked thin and splotchy. After that fail, I tried rattle cans of metallic aluminum, but again, it was virtually impossible to get a smooth, consistent finish. If you applied the rattle can paint too lightly, you'd get a splotchy kind of finish. If you went too heavy, you got runs. I had to keep sanding out bad spots and repainting. For what at first appeared to be nothing more than a simple silver paint job, this sure was a pain. I finally got a decent paint job, and I later found a way to make it even better. So, this would have to do for right now. After the paint dried, I installed the legs and was really starting to feel it. I used Molotow Chrome for the hydraulic tubes on the landing gear. This added a nice bit of variety to the bottom of the ship. The legs were not easy to fit in. You have to squeeze the ends to get them roughly in place, and then you have to spread the ends to get them over the spots where they seat. Once in, they're rock solid though. I can now figure out the last drilling spots on the main deck floor. I use the center council to make the marks on the floor for the lights. This way, each light would be right underneath its appropriate screen. Then I just took out the drill and made the holes. Now I can go ahead and paint the floor, but I'm going to do it wrong here. I only paint the center of the floor in the tan color that I'll be using in the interior. I failed to paint the entire floor first, and I'm going to have to go back and redo this. Since I already had the tan paint out to improperly paint the floor, I decided I would save myself some effort and start painting the interior walls. With all of those parts drying, I can head back and focus on the lower hull. The legs have been installed, as I said, so now I can go ahead and put in the walls of the landing bays. This needed to wait, as the back wall has a piece of glass in it, and also you need to apply some black paint to the surface behind the glass. With all of that done, I can finally install the landing bay walls. For the window, I turned to Tester's Window Glue. This stuff is great. By using the Tester's Window Glue, if I do get some on the glass, it'll dry clear and not be noticeable. I use that glue on all of the clear parts. I did use clamps here while the glue dries because you want a nice tight fit so you don't get any light leaks through the landing wells.
Yes, there is a bunch of back and forth here, but that's the nature of all this detail painting and small sub-assemblies. Here I am prepping the interior walls for the accent color. I chose similar colors to the kit instructions, but a little bit more in keeping with my personal tastes. A purist would probably call me out on this, but if I were to invite a hundred friends over to see the finished product, not one would be able to point out any variances, so I'm doing it the way I like. To mask these parts, I covered the raised element with tape, burnished down the edges, and then trimmed the tape by running an X-Acto knife along the raised edge. I first masked all the parts, and then I can head back to the paint booth. I chose a nice Tamiya flat brown to go as an accent color against the tan. After painting all of the panels, I removed the tape and then again set those aside to dry. Tired of hearing me say that yet? Now I can really focus on the control panel. The command console is a vital part of this build. It's very visible and is lighted to boot, so it has to be well done. The model kit comes with clear inserts for the console, and the photo itch kit says you can flip these over and use them as a base. Do not do this. Epic mistake. Make clear parts with some flat, thin, clear plastic, like from a, a package, maybe like a battery package. Using these clear panels made everything stand too tall and I would have had massive light bleed from around the edges. I was forced to make a frame for each panel with sheet styrene to prevent this, all while wishing I had simply made nuclear parts. The Paragraphics Photo Etch Kit comes with, of course, a photo etch, but also sheets designed to be backlit and decals. I used a little bit of the tester's window glue to glue the radar screens onto the clear bases. A tip here, use the photo etch panels to help align those radar screens. I ruined the first one, but fortunately the kit comes with a couple of extras. This is essentially a sandwich of the clear base, the transparent image, the photo etch panel, and finally some decals. Again, I'm really doing things the way I like them. I love the look of plain old raw photo etch, so I often don't paint over it or cover it. At this point, I can continue working my way through the sub-assemblies, applying the photo etch and the decals. There's a lot of it, but it really makes a huge difference in the final look of your kit.
In this case, I'll cut up the decals that are intended to go over the panels and only use select parts so I can get the best of both worlds. Here you can get a better idea of what I was talking about. There's supposed to be an entire decal that goes completely over the control panels. I didn't like that. I like the look of the photo etch. It just looks realistic. So I'm just cutting off small pieces from the bigger decal and then I'm going to apply just those little parts to add some visual interest. This is one of my favorite parts of the entire model. This panel features the circuit block cabinet, the red ball cabinet, and the CompuTranslator cabinet. It has so much detail and it's so fun. We're going to come back to it when I finish it. And when it's lit, it is just amazing. After substantially finishing with the photo etch and decals, I can start going back through the model and doing some of the detail painting. Your best friend here is going to be a good brush. Many people think you need the finest brush you can get. I find it makes painting tougher, not easier. The brush doesn't hold enough paint and it can be very difficult to get it onto the model. I prefer a slightly bigger brush that is a little bit fuller but one that can still come to a fine point. As you have seen time and again, I am indeed using my lighted visor. I actually have two of them. One is mainly for general purpose use, it's the one I use most often and the other is for great, great magnification. I think they're both essential, and there are links in the comments down below where you can get these. This panel is a perfect example of how realistic and how things just come together with these little bits of details. For the freezing tube walls, I misted the back side of them with some Tamiya White Fine Primer. This will hide the electronics behind them and it diffuses the lights that I'll eventually install. I can also begin building the freezing tubes themselves. The freezing tubes were very cleverly designed so as to help you build them and not get glue all over the place. These get installed later, after the floor is put in place, but this was pure hell. I'll talk more about that later.
here are the finished walls and you can see the circuit wall. I didn't put the decals on the individual circuit blocks. I just painted the dividing lines and then each block with Tamiya clear paints and it came out great. Hey everybody, I don't normally interject myself into the middle of my projects, but I'm doing it today because I gotta tell you, I'm super excited. As you can see here, I have most of the sub assemblies done and today is a milestone in the Jupiter 2 build in that I'm going to start laying in the electronics. It's something I've been looking forward to doing. I'm excited about it. I think it's a lot of fun. And so we're going to be getting to that today. I can't wait. Anyhow, back to the build. I'm getting really excited because it's time to start laying in some of the electronics. Again, I'm going to start putting some labels down so I can keep my mind in the right place and understand how things are supposed to line up. This build is going to move fast from here on out. The wiring bundle is thick and confusing. Lay it down on a clear area and start gently sorting it all out. Match the colors of the wires as they are indicators of the light colors. For example, blue wires are blue lights, yellow is yellow, and so on. Everything is clearly labeled also. Lay the core down in the center of your work area and start to lay things out in groups. Use the install directions to help you lay these things out in a proper direction. The main goal here right now is to just get this bag of snakes laid out straight. Following the lighting kit instructions and using one of the extra static tube bases, glue the fusion core lighting unit into the base. While gluing these parts in, do not use hot glue unless, like I'm using here, you have a dual temperature gun. I'm gluing with low melt temperatures here. If you don't have a gun like this, you can use epoxy or silicone, but don't use hot glue. Once dry, you can then start moving light bundles into a rough position on the lower hull. Next, you want to get the two circuit boards, the two switches, and the power jack installed according with the lighting kit directions. Take your time here, work methodically. This is no time to screw the pooch.
yes, it takes a while and it takes a lot of patience. But as you can see, things are really starting to get cleaned up and organized here. This is going to make moving forward so much easier. I should have followed my own advice and moved the switch holes further back when I drilled them out. As it was, I had to fight to get the switches into the landing bays properly. It finally came together with a bit of coaxing, but it sure was a lot more work than it needed to be. As a precaution, after installing the switches, I put a little bead of hot glue around each one just to make sure it stayed locked in place. Once the fusion core and the switches are in the landing bays, this is the perfect time to do a test of the lights. This will allow you to make sure that everything is working fine. After this point, if something isn't working, it's going to be damn hard to fix it later. Okay, so we have the basic placement and I've got it plugged in here. We're going to turn it on and see if everything's working. blue lights, there's some green ones, yellow, bunch of white ones, what else we got, okay I don't know when these come on, they must come on with the momentary switch, and then here we've got some red, yellow, and white ones all working, now let's push the momentary switch, okay, Okay, so these are now working. Look at that, they're flashing. And I can see the fusion core running. If I push it again, it should go faster. That's pretty cool. Now you can understand why I like this stuff so much. Look at that. And then slow back down. and then off. All right, everything's working. We can go ahead and finish laying this out, make sure everything's in its right place, and then we can get the floor on. With the switches and circuit boards in and everything tested, I can now go ahead and start putting in the lights. First, we'll put in the lights for the landing bays. When I'm done with the landing bay lights, I can start putting the lights into the deck. Keep things neat and organized, 
because after that you're going to have to put the deck down and make sure that it sits flat and even, which sounds a lot easier than it really is. Now, I told you earlier I had an issue with the freezing tubes, so this is as good a chance as any to explain. According to the instructions, the freezing tubes are supposed to be put in after the floor is in place. Well, I think this is a huge mistake. Getting the locating pins for the freezing tubes in place without getting glue all over the place was awful. In my opinion, it would be vastly easier to glue those in before gluing the floor down. If anyone is going to try that in the build like this, please let me know how it works out. Alright, I'm sorry for the washed out view you're getting of me, but I need the extra light here. And I just wanted to come in while I'm doing this and, and tell you that, you know, this lighting is not, seriously, it's not that difficult. It's not for the faint of heart, but anybody can do it if you're using one of these lighting kits. Um, I'm going to do some videos on lighting other models um, without a lighting kit, but really anybody can do this. You just need to be slow and methodical, keep everything organized so you know where everything's at, and uh, just, just work each step one at a time. So seriously, anybody can do this. It's to me a lot of fun. But, uh, like I said, you know, you have to go in this with the mindset that I'm going to take my time. I'm going to do this slowly and methodically, and I'm going to get it right. And if you do that, you're going to have a great success with this, and you're really going to enjoy your time doing it. So, don't be afraid to give this a try. Um, in the end, you're going to be so excited and happy with the results, seriously, like, my, you know, I've, I've mentioned it before on my channel here that my Enterprise model is actually one of my favorite possessions, and I'm not a Trekkie. Um, it's one of my favorite possessions just because it's so stinking cool, and this is going to be just as cool. So, you know, don't, don't be afraid. Give it a shot, and I do hope to do some other videos um, to show you how you can light some of your own stuff without one of these kits. But, having said that, um, if, if you're going to do the Enterprise or if you're going to do the Chupert 2 and you can get this pre-made lighting kit, it really is the way to go. It makes everything so much easier and uh, I highly recommend it. So, anyhow, let's get back to putting these lights in. To attach the lights under the freezing tubes, I first clamped them in place and then used some glue to glue them down. This gave me great control over how to position these lights. Be sure not to leave them too proud of the floor as this will compound the difficulty you'll have in gluing in the freezing tubes.
I can now go ahead and flip the floor over and put it into the lower hull. Do not glue it down until you're 150% positive you have all the wires under it clear and that the floor is sitting flat. This step here is also a great example of why I was constantly labeling stuff like the bow of the ship on the lower hull and on the bottom of the deck. Things can get confusing very, very fast and this helps make sure you get everything together properly. This video is in excess of an hour and 13 minutes long, so we're going to split it into two parts, and this will conclude part one. In part two, we're going to pick it back up with the interior. I hope you've been enjoying it so far. Until the next video, be good.